All right, let's talk about chapter nine, airway management. Okay, we're gonna talk about the airway physiology, the air, airway pathophysiology, opening the airway, different adjuncts we can use, suctioning, uh, keeping an airway open, and special considerations. All right, the physiology of the airway, okay. We have our upper airway, it begins at the mouth and nose. Uh, the air is warmed and humidified in the nasal turbinates. Okay, uh, then it goes into the pharynx, which is made up of the oropharynx, the nasopharynx, and the uh, laryn laryngopharynx, okay, and it ends at the glottic opening. So again, our, we're just talking about the upper airway. It's the mouth and the nose and the things in the throat until it gets to the glottic opening. We're talking, that's what we're talking about, upper airway. And here's a side cut picture. You can see the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, the top, okay, down into the laryngopharynx. All right, and then we have the lower airway. So we're talking about the lower airway. It begins below the larynx, and it's composed of the trachea, bronchial passages, and the alveoli, which we talked a little bit about in chapter seven. And again, here's the same picture that we saw in chapter seven. All right, different kinds of uh, airway obstructions, okay. Bronchoconstriction can be a disorder of the lower airway uh, where the smooth muscle constricts internal diameter of the airway, all right. Uh, so how do we assess these people, okay? Um, these things need to be addressed in the primary assessment, which we haven't got to yet because this class is a little mixed up um, more so than we would normally do, but that's okay. Um, but we need to, part of patient assessment is, uh, asking them questions, okay? We need to uh, identify issues with the airway, breathing, and circulation. So that's part of our primary assessment. Um, so how do we assess the airway, okay? Is it open and will it stay open? If it's not uh, open now or if we're concerned that it's not gonna stay open, um, there's certain things that we need to do to take precautions, okay? Um, most patients can be, we can determine that their airway is open just by simply saying hello. Okay, if their airway is not open, they're not going to be able to talk to us. So if they're choking, um, they're not going to be able to talk to us. And uh, obviously, if they're unresponsive uh, and their airway is not open, they're not going to be able to say hello as well. Uh, the sniffing position can be seen when swelling obstructs the airflow through the upper airway. So if they have some kind of swelling in their throat and it's affecting uh, their airway, you might see the person sticking their head out a little bit, sniffing position, their heads up a little bit, because they're trying to open their own airway. And that can be an indicator to us that there's a serious problem going on. Okay, uh, certain things we can look for uh, to indicate breathing problems. Inability to speak, we just talked about, an unusually raspy quality uh, to the voice. Strider, which is a, a lung sound that we'll get into at some point. Um, we have little sounders where you can put your stethoscopes up to them and you can hear what the different lung sounds are. Uh, snoring and gurgling. Um, you know, I'd like to recommend to you guys too, if you get onto Google and you type in airway sounds, one of the first pages that come up, it'll actually play different types of air uh, lung sounds and they'll, they'll identify them as strider or ronchi or wheezes or these different sounds that we need to be listening for. That'll give you guys an opportunity to, uh, to hear those. All right, so I'd encourage you to check that out, okay? Will the airway stay open, okay? Airway assessment is not just a moment in time, it's a constant consideration, meaning that right now your patient, your unresponsive patient, just for example, he has an airway. It's open, they're breathing okay, all that's fine, but as you progress through the call, that can change. So especially with our unresponsive patients, the airway needs to be constantly monitored. We need to make sure that they are, uh, the airway is still open. All right, some signs of an inadequate airway could be no signs of breathing or air movement. So we're gonna look at their chest and we're gonna see, is there adequate chest rise and fall? Okay, when we listen to lung sounds, is there air moving on both sides? And we'll teach you guys how to take uh, lung sounds, okay? Uh, is there evidence of a foreign body in the airway? You know, when we are in our unresponsive patients, we have to, and they're laying down, 
uh, the way we can check for an airway is, well, one, we're going to be listening to lung sounds, but two, open their mouth. Are their teeth stuck in there? Are their dentures? Is there something stuck in their airway uh, that we can, we can help them with, okay? Uh, again, the no air felt or heard. We're going to be listening to lung sounds, uh, inability or difficulty speaking, raspy voice, or the uneven chest movement. Okay, abdominal breathing. All right, if they're having a problem with uh, their airway, uh, a lot of times we'll see them uh, abdominal breathing. So that's kind of where you'll see their stomach rise and fall, a lot more so than their chest, okay? Abnormal sounds such as wheezing, crowing, strider, snoring, gurgling, or gasping during breathing. Again, these are different sounds that you'll, you'll be able to hear uh, later on in class, or if you go to Google and find the, uh, the lung sounds um, section, in there, you can hear those sounds. All right, nasal flaring in infants and children. You'll actually see retractions in the chest and the clavicles in the children as well. So these are all indicators of an uh, inadequate airway. Okay, these videos again, uh, we won't watch this video now, but if you wanna look, th these, are, these are things you're gonna get in CPR. So we're not gonna get too much into it right now. Okay, opening the airway. So when the primary assessment indicates inadequate airway, a life-threatening condition exists, okay? They are suffocating, they're choking on something, whatever the case is, if their airway is not open, this is absolutely life-threatening and we need to address this right now, okay? Uh, if the airway is not open, use a position to open it, all right? And again, you'll learn about this more so in CPR, but uh, there's two different ways we can open the airway. One is the head tilt chin lift method. And the other would be the jaw thrust method, okay? Uh, we will not use the head tilt chin lift method uh, if we suspect a spinal injury, okay? That case, we would be using the jaw thrust method, all right? And again, you will be learning about this stuff in CPR. You'll learn a little bit more about this uh, when we get to the skills portion, okay? But here's a picture right here, the head tilt chin lift maneuver. All right, so we're gonna push back on the forehead a little bit, push up on the chin, and you're actually moving the head up and that's gonna open up your airway. This really has to be managed. When the patient moves around a little bit and you're not paying attention, their head could come back down and close the airway off again. Okay, don't allow the mouth to close. And here's the jaw thrust maneuver. So now we're suspecting a spinal injury, a possible spinal injury, and uh, this is how we're gonna be able to open their airway. So you get your fingers right underneath their jaw and you push it forward. And if you do it on your loved one to practice, it kind of hurts a little bit. I mean, you shouldn't be digging in too deep, um, but that is what you do. You push the jaw forward. Okay, and again, we, these are, we'll, you will have opportunities to practice these things. Okay, airway management. After the airway's been opened, position must be maintained to keep the airway open. Okay, this, again, this is a constant consideration throughout your entire call. Okay, different adjuncts we can use. By adjuncts, we mean there's a couple different devices that we can use to uh, assist with keeping the airway open. All right, uh, they are short-term solutions. Obviously, if they get to the hospital or you have a paramedic on board for this, they might wanna use a different device uh, beyond what we have, but these are pretty helpful. Um, if you have an airway issue, we have our oral pharyngeal airway or OPA. Um, a lot of times we'll just call it an oral airway or the nasopharyngeal airway uh, or nasal airway as we usually call it. And there'll be some examples coming up here in a minute. All right, we use the or oral airway only on patients not exhibiting a gag reflex. Usually our go-to is the oral airway. Uh, if we start to insert this airway, into their mouth and they start to gag, we have to pull it out immediately. We don't want them to puke on us. We don't want them to puke on themselves uh, or aspirate or anything like that. Okay, uh, open the patient's airway manually before using the device. And when inserting the airway, take care not to push the patient's tongue into the pharynx. There's a way to do it and we will look at some pictures momentarily. Okay, always have suction ready prior to inserting any airway because if they do gag and they do puke, we need to suction them immediately, okay? If you're considering airway, make sure you have suction nearby, okay? 
Uh, continue to be ready to provide suction if fluid or blood obstructs the airway. Uh, if the patient regains consciousness or develops a gag reflex, remove the airway immediately. All right. So this is a device uh, used to move the tongue forward as it curves back to the pharynx. This is the oral airway we're talking about. And there's different sizes of the oral airway. There's real small ones, and then there's um, bigger ones for adults. Uh, we will see how to measure them. Here's a picture of the oral airways. Obviously they have real little ones for the kids and bigger ones for the adults. Okay, so when we size up, and this, these will be test questions right here, okay? Uh, when we size an oral airway, we measure from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the earlobe, okay? That airway there, right there in this picture is a perfectly sized airway and that one is good to go, we can use it, okay? So when we insert the oral airway, we're gonna put the patient on their back and use the appropriate method to open the airway. We're gonna open the mouth with a cross finger technique. We don't ever stick our fingers in a patient's mouth, ever, okay? All right, position the airway with a tip pointing toward the roof of the mouth. So you actually have the thing upside down as you insert it into the patient's mouth. And then you turn it as you get, uh, as you insert it. So here's your cross finger technique right here. So open up the mouth like that. All right, insert the device along the roof of the mouth. And then gently rotate the airway 180 degrees so the tip is pointing down into the patient's pharynx. Okay. Monitor the patient closely. Again, see how he's got it facing up, all right? And then as he inserts it, he's gonna twist it and it's gonna be down. And we have uh, mannequins at the college for you guys to be able to practice this. It's very, very simple to do, okay? So that is an oral airway. So onto the nasal airway. It's a soft, flexible tube inserted through the nostril and into the hypopharynx. It moves the tongue and soft tissue forward to provide a channel for air. Can be used in patients with an intact gag reflex or a clenched jaw. So if you have clenched jaw, excuse me. If you have a patient uh, that has, has gag reflex uh, or a clenched jaw, some reason you can't get the oral in. I've had this happen before where you just have trouble just getting it in. People have different sized mouths. And even though it's the right length, sometimes you have trouble getting it in. A lot of times, I like to just go with the nasal airway. You just lube it up and you shove it in there and it's pretty easy to do. Um, so don't be afraid to use this uh, if you can't get an oral airway in. It is contraindicated though. If there's any clear fluid coming from the nose or ears, you suspect serious head trauma. We don't wanna shove this thing into their brain, okay? So this is something we'll learn when we get to head trauma, the clear fluid coming from the nose or ears. Those are things to be looking for. But assuming we can put a nasal airway in, they come in various sizes, they must be measured. And the typical adult sizes, they're in French. So these are different, uh, different lengths. And it's 34, 32, 30, and 28 French. That's how they're measured. Um, there's bigger ones, uh, there's smaller ones. Uh, those are typical adult sizes though. Okay, so when we insert, we wanna measure for correct size. And when we measure, we're gonna go from the tip of the nose to the tip of the earlobe. Now just remember, the oral is tip of the mouth to the tip of the earlobe. This uh, nasal is tip of the nose to the tip of the earlobe, okay? Uh, we wanna lubricate the outside of the tube with water-based lubricant before insertion. Every nasal airway kit I've ever seen comes with little lube packets. All right, lube the thing up pretty good. All right, see, that's how we measure it right there. That's a good size. Lube it up. Okay, and then we're gonna insert it. We're gonna push the tip of the nose upward, keep the head in a neutral position. Insert into the nostril, advance until the flange rests firmly against the nostril. And this is how you do it right there. It's very easy. Just shove this thing up their nose and it helps keep their airway open. All right, on to suctioning, okay. We need to be concerned about anything in a patient's mouth, especially to the unresponsive patients and those, one, and those ones on their back. So imagine if a patient vomits in their mouth and they're on their back, they're likely going to aspirate, they're gonna inhale some of that vomit, it's very bad. So we need to get these people on their side and we need to start suctioning, okay? Uh, we use a vacuum device to remove liquids from the airway. 
Uh, we have mounted suction units, uh, can be installed near the head of the stretcher, uh, furnish air intake of at least 30 liters per minute, um, and generate a vacuum of no less than 300 millimeters of mercury when the collecting tube is clamped. So we all have a dial on our suction units, uh, and those dials can be set to 300 or more, um, but part of 800, which is our New York State regulations uh, on our ambulances, it has to generate a vacuum of no less than 300 millimeters of mercury. This will be a test question, I promise you, okay? You need to know that, okay? And then we have our, port that was our uh, mounted suction units. This would be our portable suction units. All right, they're the same requirements as the mounted ones, so they still need to be able to produce 300 mill millimeters of mercury uh, for vacuum, okay? Uh, they can be oxygen or air powered or powered by batteries, electricity. There are manual ones. Um, we've had them here at work before. They're really not good. They're better than nothing, but they are, they, I've used them and they're, they're, they're very difficult. They don't suck very well. Um, what I recommend is just having a portable suction units that are battery operated. You can plug them right into your ambulance and so they're always charged. Um, and then just unplug them and go. And uh, that, those are the, definitely the best ones out there. <clears throat> okay, different types of tubing, suction tips, and catheters um, that can come with these units. There's a collection container um, on the, your devices. I, I, as I tell every class, I know some of you aren't in a department, um, but I encourage everybody to find out what you have on your ambulance and become familiar with it. Because what we have at the college is um, just a different brand, it's a different style. Um, they all do the same thing, but the buttons are in different places and uh, things of that nature. So um, you need to be familiar with what you're gonna be using in real life, okay? This is just an example of a, a mounted suction unit in the patient's um, compartment. Uh, tubing tips and catheters. There's a rigid, the most common one tip that we'll use for a suction device is the rigid um, suction tip. It's called a Yankauer tip. Um, they are larger bore than flexible catheters. The flexible ones, which you'll see, um, we'll show them to you guys, but uh, this, the, the flexible ones are really good for stomas and you know the holes in the throat of certain patients. Um, it's good for clearing them out, but the yank hour tip, the rigid one, is, uh, is really a lot better for anything big, okay? So there's a picture of uh, proper suctioning technique. We don't want to go in too far, but we will teach you guys exactly how to do that. All right, uh, more on tubing tips and catheters. Uh, the rigid tip, we want to suction only as far as you can see. These are key principles to suctioning, by the way, and you will be asked these multiple times throughout class. You will be tested on this stuff, so make sure you're paying attention. All right, uh, suction only as far as you can see. Don't lose sight of the distal end. Don't shove it so far back in the throat you can't see it, basically what this means, okay? Careful insertion helps prevent gag reflex or vagal stimulation, okay? We don't want them to puke uh, or bear down because we're pushing things in the back of their throat, okay? We don't need to go that far back. Oops, I went too far there. All right, then we have our flexible suction catheters. They're designed to be used when the rigid tip cannot be used. Okay, they can be passed through a tube such as a nasal airway or an endotracheal tube. Um, you'll be seeing, you know, we're not doing anything with endotracheal tubes, but uh, the nasal pharyngeal, nasal pharyngeal airway, you can shove the uh, uh, soft suction catheter inside there. All right, uh, they come in various sizes identified by the number in French. So again, uh, this is another um, time that they use French as a measurement. Um, so the catheters are different sizes, different lengths and different widths. So again, be familiar with what you have in your ambulance. There's certain requirements that the state has for us to have a minimum of so many different sizes. Okay, the larger the number, the larger the catheter. Uh, use appropriate infection control practices when suctioning, okay? I wear masks. I mean, we're all wearing masks now on every call all the time, some type of mask. All right, we always want to be wearing our gloves. Uh, I wear is probably not a bad idea either. Think about your suctioning and airway. If you, if you do hit the gag reflex or they puke and they spray it in your face, we don't want to get their vomit in our eyes, okay? And these people are getting prepared to do some suctioning on their patient. 
Okay, techniques. Suction, no longer than 10 seconds at a time. That will be a test question. No longer than 10 seconds at a time. Okay, prolonged suctioning can cause hypoxia and bradycardia. If a patient vomits for longer than 10 seconds, though, you can continue to suction. So the textbook answer is suction no longer than 10 seconds. In real life, if a patient is continuously vomiting over longer than 10 seconds, you are allowed to leave it in there a little bit longer, and that is straight from the state protocols. Okay, place the tip of the catheter where you want to begin suctioning and suction on the way out. Now on the, just looking for a picture here. On the, uh, on your, your rigid uh, suction catheters, there's gonna be a little hole. Okay, the suction doesn't actually start until you put your thumb or your finger over that hole. And I know it's very difficult for me to <laughs> describe in this format. And we'll show these things to you, okay? But you place the tip where you want it and then you put your finger over the hole on the, the uh, catheter tip and then you suction on your way out. So you're going around in circles in the patient's mouth and you're pulling it out as you go for no more than 10 seconds, okay? Suction, yeah, you can suction uh, the oral pharyngeal airway. You can kind of get in next to it. Uh, some of them have little slots on the side that you can fit a, uh, some suction in there. All right, definitive care, keeping an airway open. Keeping the airway open may exceed the capabilities of a basic EMT. Medications or surgical procedures may be necessary to resolve the airway obstruction, meaning we may not be able to fix their airway issue. We're going to do everything we can to try, um, but sometimes there's something lodged into their throat that we can't get out. Uh, there's nothing we're going to be able to do, but we're going to do uh, everything that we can to try to fix the problem. Okay, this is why it's important for us to rapidly evaluate and treat airway problems. Quickly identify what's going on. If it's beyond our capability, we need to drive real fast to the hospital and or meet a medic en route. Okay, they can do some more things than we can. Um, but we need to quickly recognize if uh, one more definitive care is necessary. Okay, is ALS, is that paramedic closer than the hospital? Or is, okay, what's, what's the closest, fastest way to get this person to an advanced level of care beyond what we can? Okay, us in the city, uh, sometimes if we're waiting for a medic to come in from, from outside the city, uh, for, for a paramedic to come in, sometimes the hospital's closer and faster. So we might take this call to the hospital uh, on our BLS ambulance uh, and not even meet a, <clears throat> meet a medic because it's actually faster for us to just get to the hospital. All right, special considerations. Dental appliances. Um, somebody has dentures. We should always just try to leave them in place. Uh, if they become dislodged uh, during the emergency, we can remove them. If you think they're gonna be a problem, if they're loose and they're flopping around in their mouth, it might be a good idea to get them out. Uh, but for the most part, just leave them where they are. Okay, note on pediatrics, a variety of anatomical differences to consider when managing the airway, okay? They have a small, kids have smaller mouth and nose. They have a larger tongue and a narrow, flexible trachea, okay? Generally speaking too, kids have bigger heads, just proportionately to their bodies than adults do. So it's a lot easier to close off a kid's airway when you have them laying on their back, which is uh, the, what? The supine position, right? When you have them in the supine position, um, it's a lot easier for them to have their head come forward and actually close off their airway. So there's just, just some considerations we should be taking for pediatrics. Here's a picture of it right here, actually. Okay, airway obstructions are a lot easier in kids. So you can see this kid's head is just a little bit bigger, proportionately, all right? And it's a lot easier for that head to tip forward and cut off the airway. All right, so pediatric management considerations. Uh, open the airway gently. Don't hyperextend the neck, so don't pull it back too far. Uh, consider adjuncts when other measures fail. Use a rigid tip with an adjunct, but do not touch the back of the airway. That's with any patient, not just pediatrics. Real quick review. Always use proper PPE when managing an airway. We can get puked on, we can get coughed on, we can do, oh, okay, especially in those days of COVID, we need to be protecting ourselves, right? Uh, airway assessment must be an ongoing process. Airway status can change over time and it can change very quickly, all right? So really keep an eye on this stuff with your patients. 
Airway management should start uh, simply and become more complicated only if necessary. Uh, questions to consider. Uh, name the main structures of the airway. Remember we got the larynx, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. Okay, just make sure you understand the differences between those parts of the body. Um, explain why care for the airway is the first priority of a patient care, of emergency care, okay? Right, because airway is, uh, if we don't have an airway, that patient's gonna die very quickly. That's why ABCs, uh, we wanna worry about their airway first. And describe the signs of an inadequate airway. We talked about all this stuff. And that's the end of this section. All right, and we'll close this video out and we will get to the next section.